important to have also just uh, careful not to step too far forward under the speaker that's above you. Just stand back a little bit. Right there. Yes. Yeah. There's a speaker about me. Speaker. Yeah. Oh, right there. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Sorry, technical difficulties first time. So today we're talking about California and its story with uh, the challenges and resources it has. Um, there's uh, we have abundance of people and uh, abundance of fertile land and cropland and how do we tie all that in with our scarcity of water so what are the challenges what are the opportunities what are the resources and how do we combine all that to make a very good picture um, that paints a great like, landscape um, for California if you've ever driven through it has all types of climates has one of the highest peaks in California or excuse me in the continental United States and the also the lowest um, point in the United States all in California all within about 100 miles of each other as a crow flies um, also has the seventh largest economy in the world. Um, we live in a, a gorgeous lifestyle. We have uh, beaches, we have snowboarding, we have all that. We have a great, the state is, is a very perfect, perfectly placed pl uh, state for all those types of activities. But there is one issue is that, um, you know, water usually falls in the northern part of the state and not all the population centers are in the top part of the state, they're in the lower part of the state. So how do we get water from top of the state to the bottom state. So today we're gonna to cover, before we get to the conveyance system, we're gonna talk about um, weather patterns, what's a rain shadow effect, um, what's a water, call, water, water molecule made of, why, what's some of the properties of water, uh, kind of get into the chemistry of it, so if I kind of nerd out a little bit, that's why. Um, but let's go ahead and start. So um, typically in, we're getting into, we're gonna get into El Nino and La Nina, but we're in a La Nina year right now. Um, Generally, storms that roll in are generally come from the northwest, and they come in on a storm from the jet stream, and um, they send that if in the North Pacific they send storms inland to Southern California. Um, our precipitation, our months that we usually get precipitation, range from November to April. There can be April showers, but typically to to March. Um, but we do live in a Mediterranean cl climate, and that's a one big thing that there's not too many of these Mediterranean climates around the world. That's what allows California to grow and sustain all these great crops and, um, and have these, these picturesque lifestyles that we've mentioned before. So like I said earlier, um, rain falls to the west and in the, in the north. Um, it could reach above 50 inches. Like I said, we're going we're gonna to do averages here. When you see numbers, don't take these as hard numbers because as you can see, this has been an extremely dry year for the state. So when we say plus 50 inches, that's on average. Um, it not every year, sometimes it'll be more, sometimes it'll be less. So we're talking about average. And driest in the south, about five inches. Um, that would be out towards our Newberry, Barstow area. Um, that's about five inches of rain that they get. So when we talk about Mediterranean lifestyle or Mediterranean climates, there's only certain areas in the United or in the, in the world that have this Mediterranean climate, um, and you can picture, you can see them here: um, California, northern Northern Baja, um, Central Chile, right here, the West Cape of South Africa, um, Southwest Australia, and the Mediterranean basin right there. These, um, there's a new movie out that just deals with these these climates. These. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think there's seven distinct areas on here. They only show six. Maybe these are two. So there's seven. These are some of the best areas to grow crops, grapes, olives, pistachios, all these, all these great fruits and nuts that we like. They are grown in these central areas. Um, if you go over into the Great Plains area, you don't see many almond trees. You don't see a lot of um, uh, grapefruit trees. Why is that? Because it does, that doesn't fit the climate for that. So that's why we grow almonds. I think 80% of the almonds and grown in the, or used in the entire world are grown in California. So think about all the almonds or the almond milk or the almond shavings that you have in your cereal. All those almonds are coming from, a majority, 80% of them are coming from California. So you're not going to see them grow, being grown in, in the Great Plains area where they grow um, sorghum or, or corn or um, any other type of... Um, vegetable so or fruit so just want to throw that in there um, and then here's here's the crops that that you kind of like I said you guys don't have to write all this down this is gonna this is gonna be on your the blackboard but you can see that California crops 99% of uh, almonds artichokes dates figs olives pistachios pomegranates 
they're mainly grown in the Central Valley. So when we talk about California and its landscape, we're going to get to it here in just a minute. Just know that that is a huge area. So when you drive through the Central Valley, you're like, why is everything always green? Well, the world needs food and that's why, because we're constantly watering it and that's why there's water issues in the Central Valley and that's why we have a state water project, but that comes in further chapter. So I just kind of want to set the, the precedence of why this is so important. Why is our, our area, why is California so important to not only just our region in California, but the globe um, with all of these? Because I like walnuts, I like pomegranates. I don't want to see them go away. So typically we have weather and that's kind of what we're going through right now, which is short-term patterns in rainfall and temperature. So those are just, what's the weather like today? That's, um, you know, it, it can change from month to month, from week to week. Last week it was what, 60, 70 degrees, I was wearing a t-shirt, today it's freezing. So that's, that's weather. Um, when you talk about climate, that is gonna be long-term patterns in rainfall and temperature. So we're gonna take the weather and plot it, but then we're gonna look, and we look at the entire year, we're gonna see what the climate is, and then we're gonna attach a 20 year history onto that. That's when we're gonna look at a climate, climate analysis and see what the climate is doing. Um, in California, the hydrology, most of the water falls up where these two people are, where there's not that many people, and not a lot of water falls where mo majority of the people are here, like we're at in Southern California. So, um, I don't wanna skip too ahead, but yeah, we're gonna talk about the Gavain systems and all that in the, in the coming chapters in your book. So, uh, summer brings seasonal drought and autumn transitions hot, includes hot, dry Santa winds and wildfires. Perfect example, if you guys thought, or if you guys ever went down the hill, maybe when the, uh, maybe a month or two ago when the Santa Barbara fire was going on, it was extremely windy down the hill. It was really calm up here, but the second you go over the, 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 the pass, um, the, the Cajon Pass, you get these, these wild winds. And that's kind of what, that's what fueled the Santa Barbara fire, made it so big, was just those winds just keep fueling it. And uh, so that's, want to touch on that, try to bring something kind of relevant into the conversation. Um, mountain communities such as Lake Tahoe, Mammoth Experience, yeah, another version of California weather with six months of winter snow um, and brief summer growth season and characteristics of alpine landscapes. So you, now we see the contrast. We see, you know, uh, you know, the Inland Empire, which is basically air is southwest dry. Then we go up to Lake Tahoe or Mammoth and we have basically a climate of uh, high five to six thousand seven thousand feet and above weather pattern where it's colder or it gets snow or it gets precipitation every single year. So um, California's uh, landscape is responsible for a wide range of precipitation patterns. We're going to get into that, but um, I, if you guys, I, I encourage all of you guys to download Google Earth on your computer and zoom out of California and just look and see what you observe. You can see that up here in the northern part of um, I don't know if you guys see me at, at, in the high schools, but up here, mainly a lot of things are green. The, the further you get down, the sparser it kind of gets. And then when you split over into the Mojave Desert, kind of where we're at, you get dry. You go down to Coachella, you get dry out there. But then you see the Central Valley where it's all nice and green. Um, so a lot of that's artificial because we pump groundwater to, to, to uh, fuel crops. But And then you can see the Sierra Nevadas right here and then the coastal range. So. I encourage you just to look at Google Earth and just look at the topography of California. You'll, you will learn a lot about just looking why the mountains right here. Oh, okay, why does it usually rain more in San Bernardino than it does here? We're gonna get to that in just a second. So um, here's the topography of California. So we have the Central Valley that runs almost the entire length of the state, basically from the, uh, um, I call it the garlic fault running that way, and um, the, the base of the San Bernardino Mountains right here from the Central Valley going up to um, the Klamath Mountain or the Klamath River Basin. That's the entire Central Valley. So that's when I'm talking about the Mediterranean climate that grows all the great crops. That's what I'm talking about. But we do have coastal ranges, which includes the mountains. Kind of if you drive up to Santa Barbara, you guys see the mountains right on the, right on the, the coast. Um, you have the Sierra Nevadas where we get a lot of our water from. So um, this is a watershed glass. So that's where a lot of our, our, our water comes from fall in a snow and slowly melt it over the spring and uh, replenish our aquifers as well as provide water to LA and other cities such as that, even to San Francisco. Um, and we also get water from the Colorado River and also the Klamath River up here. So um, you can kind of see on the right hand side, this is uh, a precipitation map. 
basically the darker purple bluish colors, the more rain that's going to fall. Uh, the red, the red blotted out parts are where the major population centers are. So you're going to see a lot around San Francisco. You see LA and San Diego. Uh, not most of the rain, a uh, majority of the rain that is over five inches falls in Northern California or in the Sierra Nevadas. So skipping ahead a couple chapters, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we've built conveyance systems to move water around California because it doesn't all fall in Southern California. It falls in Northern California. And we've built these systems to support our lifestyle that we, that we enjoy today. So don't want to jump too much into that. Um, rain, snow, rainfall, rain and snowfall result in humid, humid mass air masses blown in from the ocean to interact with the state's mountain ranges. So for every two to four inches, so, so when a cloud moves in, and we're going to get in the rain shower here in a second. So, but basically when clouds rise about three, 300 feet, and you guys have heard this when they talk about Oh, the snow level's at 3,000 feet t this, tonight. That means that you know, right around 3,000 feet, you're going to get snow. If you're higher than that, you're going to get even more snow. So um, when we talk about precipitation, it generally increases 2 to 4 inches for every 300-foot rise. So when you have a big storm coming in, depending on the weather and the cold fronts and all that, depending on what elevation you are, um, the precipitation can, can vary greatly depending on um, where you are elevation-wise. Um, seasonal snowfall totals about two feet at 3,000 feet elevation at Sierra Nevada foothills, but increases the 34 feet at Donner Summit. So Donner Summit is just north of Lake, Lake Tahoe. So if you guys are wondering Donner Summit, um, it's kind of Donner family, you can Google it. But that Donner Summit uh, usually has a lot of snow at it on average. So at 7,000 feet in the Sequoia National Park, you see the picture on the left where it's just snow covered you know, this is a top of a tree, and it's probably got, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet of snow there. Um, on the right, you can see where the major tributaries are flowing into the river, into the ocean or inland. You can see the Colorado River here. Um, if you guys ever like to go out to the river or the lake, um, that's where you're going. This little blue line right here, it's kind of hard to see. That blue line, that's the Mojave River. So see how that kind of starts inland and ends inland? So we're kind of in a closed basin. So that's why it, Water, we push water conservation. That's why everyone should push water conservation, but even us because we're in a closed basin and um, we don't have access to salt water if we need to to do desalinization or anything like that. But you can see, you can see a lot more. The thickness of the line uh, depends on how many, or the, the more thicker the line, the more acre feet flows, which we're gonna get into that in just a minute. So basically, like we said, rain falls up north. There's a lot of people down south and you can see there's not too many natural stream flows in California to the south. So uh, the Sierra Nevada occupies one fifth of the land and air in California and has a major influence on climate, weather, and water supply. It extends 430 miles north to south, um, so, um, 8,000 foot summits in the north and rise over to 14,000 feet in just in the south, um, intersecting westernly jet stream. So what that means is jet stream is moving from east to west and when when storms roll in, they hit the Sierra Nevadas and um, they, it, they drop their precipitation as rain or snow. Um, most precipitation in the Sierra Nevada solves as winter snow. So like I said, that's this big snowpack and I have some slides in here depicting that. I hope they're coming up here soon. So let's talk about rain shadow. So here's the ocean and I, there's, I have two examples of this. So Sun hits the, hits the ocean, evaporates water, makes clouds. Those clouds then turns in the storm, and then they, the, for the jet streams start to move inland. Um, they move inland, they hit, the, they, they hit land, and like we talked about earlier, as elevation rises, um, or as clouds rise, clouds rise, they cool, and then they, 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 the precipitation drops out as rain. So as that's why they call it a rain shadow because usually on, on the back side of a hill, uh, the, the clouds will then drop in elevation, warm, the air will expand and not be so inclined to drop uh, rain. Not that it doesn't ever happen, but if you look at San Bernardino, I've, I spent eight years at college at San Bernardino and I can tell you it rains a lot harder up there than it does in Apple Valley. So just because it has to climb those San Bernardino mountains and um, the air condenses, falls as precipitation and then it has to go over the mountains and it doesn't have as much juice to drop um, as much as it did before. So, 
So here's another example, and this is actually from California. So here's San Luis Obispo. San Luis Obispo, um, for those who are looking to go to college there for engineering, it's a great school. Um, awesome climate. You can see the coastal ranges. You can see the, 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 uh, the, the coastal ranges you have here. Then you have the San Joaquin Valley, and then you have the Sierra Nevada Mountains. So this is kind of a cross section, and you're seeing if a storm were to come in, it would come in, drop, drop it, it condense rain on the front side. It wouldn't rain on the back side. It would drop, and then it would come back up cool, rain or snow, and then it would come through the, the San Joaquin Valley, and then as it goes up to Sierra Nevada, so you can see it rain all the way up, and then when it drops down, like I said, that air expands, and it's not less inclined to, to drop um, or to rain, and it comes back up, rains, and if it still has juice enough to keep going, it keeps going, but that's why this is uh, Independence, that's in the Owens Valley, so here's Sierra Nevada's. Um, San Joaquin Valley, uh, Visalia. So a lot of the Central Valley or the San Joaquin Valley gets a lot of the rainfall from what falls on the west side of the Sierra Nevadas. So um, that's what's important uh, for that valley. So kind of give you an idea that when water is kind of climbing up the hills, that's why we're a desert on this side of the mountains of the San Bernardino and the uh, San Gregorio Mountains. Not San Gregorio, excuse me. Um, the San Bernardino Mountains, because water will, or the, the storm will come up in the mountains, rain on the front side, come over, and then if it has any left, it'll rain in Hesperia, but when it gets out further in the Barstow, that's when you start to see rain levels drop. So this would be Barstow out here. We're out here, or somewhere in here, and we're past the rain shadow, so. Um, so as air descends the east side of the California, the mountain ranges, the process is reversed. Air becomes warmer and holds more of the more of its water vapor. Relatively dry rain shadows are the result, which we are in a rain shadow. The Sierra Nevada rain shadow creates it, the Great Basin Desert, and you can see the Great Basin Desert is right here. That is what encompasses Death Valley. So we talked about the highest point, which would be Mount Whitney um, in the southern ne Sierra Nevadas. And just to the east of that, we have Death Valley, which is the lowest spot in the United States, the continental United States, so just the lower 48. Um, the transverse and peninsula, tra transverse and peninsula ranges, the transverse are going to be right here. Those are going to be those mountain ranges that we have. Um, the, the, the San Bernardino Mountains right here, San Gregorio Mountains. And then you have the peninsula ranges, which is kind of the... the the Anza Borrego, the San Diego region, um, right there. Um, a broad cross-section throughout the state beginning near San Luis Obispo, and I think we show this again. So once again, that's that rain shadow. And if you look at the topography moving into a storm rolling in from the west, um, unless it's one of those El Nino storms where it just dumps a bunch of water, um, it's still going to have this rain shadow effect. Um, California receives almost... 200 million acre feet of precipitation in an average year. Um, you guys have all seen this where we don't, this year we haven't really seen much rain up here. So it really depends on what you de define as average. Um, you can argue that and we won't get into climate change yet, but um, what is an average year? That would, that's what an average year would look like. Um, when we talk about million acre feet, what is an acre feet of water? What, what is one acre foot of water looks like? Um, it's approximately 326,000 gallons, but how do you put that in perspective? It's basically one football field, one foot deep in water. So if you think about a football field, 100 yards long, um, uh, yeah, one foot deep in water. So one acre foot um, serves the annual domestic needs of um, two families, uh, one to two families of four. And that all depends on the needs. You could stretch it out to three or four families if you guys are really water con conscious. But it really depends on what is the... How are they using the water? Do they have three acres of grass? Because I can tell you that won't be enough. But if they're really uh, water, con water conscious and they can serve water, then yeah. Um, water that falls on, this, on the state may evaporate back in the atmosphere and may be used by plants and return to, rain, return to vapor to the air and then soak deep in the groundwater basins. That's what I want to so hit on, soak deep into our groundwater basins. This is a, a, a watershed management class. What we're looking for is water to run off and us to better manage the water resources up here in the high desert and across the state. And across the state. 
but we want the water to sink deep into our deep groundwater basins. Um, in the Mojave Water Agency, in the high, in the high desert, uh, everybody is served on groundwater. So um, groundwater recharge is something that we really like. I saw there's a flow in the river, so I'll probably go check that out after I leave this class. So, um, so let's see. So, um, Let's, before we get in the water water cycle, I saw I saw this water management. There was one. There's a couple things in your book. If you guys haven't read your book, you know I'd like to put sticky notes around about stuff that I, I thought was very interesting. That I was like, wow, why is that? Um, and I put this in there. Uh, water management. The Colorado River receives almost zero runoff originating inside California, meaning California does not give any water to the Colorado River watershed system. So when you look at a watershed. Of the Mojave River or the of the Mojave River Basin, it will encompass Crestline and Lake Arrowhead. Not Big Bear because Big Bear flows over on the other side of the hill, but anything that originates in Crestline or Lake Arrowhead will flow down to the Mojave River Basin. Um, so for the Colorado River, there is absolutely we do not contribute any water, any runoff um, through streams of anything like uh, to the to the Colorado River. Um, but California receives 4.4 million acre feet from that. And that's, that's mainly because of water management techniques used by large municipalities that um, hopefully you guys will work for one day. But, um, you know, that's, that's a whole different element in itself. The Colorado River system is huge, encompasses five or six states, and um, we are taking water from that river without contributing to it. So interesting point to, know, to note. Um, along, same with the Klamath River. Um, um, along with the Klamath River, water out of Oregon allows water planters to figure on the statewide supply of 78 million acre feet of annual runoff. So water that had fallen in Oregon into a river, then flowed into California through its, through its border, and then we can plan on using that water because now it's in our state. So interesting things to look at and as a water, because this class is designed to teach you guys all how to manage water and manage water better. Um, interesting things to look at. We are getting something while contributing to nothing, um, which is great for us, but looking at the whole watershed, I can tell you Lake Mead is way down. I was there last week, or this past weekend, really down. Um, uh, I'm not too sure. I haven't really investigated the Klamath River just because it's so far north, um, but I can tell you that there is stress and worry on the entire Colorado River system just based off the needs of Utah, Arizona, California. So, um, so the water cycle, water moving within California. Uh, water continuously shifts among three reservoirs, the ocean, the atmosphere, and the land. Um, these are connected by precipitation, evaporation, plant absorption, and transpira transpiration, which is evaporation through leaf pores. So um, if you don't think that water evaporates out of leaves, it definitely does. It should be evapotranspiration. Um, no water is lost in the overall planetary cycle balance. Uh, if you think of the first law of thermodynamics, um, when we when this water cycle happens, which I think is on the next slide, right here, um, if you think about the first law of thermodynamics, no, uh, nothing. Uh, how did I word it? Energy can be transformed from one form to another, but can be can neither be created nor destroyed. So, uh, what's the main driver in the water cycle? The sun. The sun makes, evaporates the water out of the ocean into clouds. Then it falls as precipitation, as ice and snow. Um, snow melts off in the streams, um, freshwater storage, and also into groundwater. And it, you, this is a, a nice diagram because it runs off into the ocean. But for us, um, it falls and it soaks into our groundwater basins. We pump it out, we use it, and either it goes into your septic system, which then slowly returns it to the aquifer, or you are on a sewer where it gets into a, a reclamation facility where we reclaim that water and discharge it into the river for downstream users. So, um, good. This is a very important thing to learn. Um, uh, we have a nice model of this that we're building um, just to show people. But the main driver of this, like I said, is the sun. So, where do you get all the energy for this? It's the sun. Did I miss something right here? Yeah. So, like I said, so recycling is powered by the sun, which evaporates water from the ocean and land. In photosynthesis, the sun's energy is what splits the bonds holding the water molecules together. Um, one one thousandth of a percent of the plant's total water is in the air. You guys ever been on a plane and seen all the clouds? 
clouds are just basically water vapor that are, are condensed. Um, yeah, the small, small percentage produces thick coastal fogs, traumatic th thunderheads, and torrential downpours. Um, continue the water cycle. 97% of all of the, uh, the Earth's water that is, avail that is available is salt water, less than 1% of available fresh water, with most of it being above ground and, and aquifers that are never fully accessible. So less than 1%. I think it, yes, it's 0.01% of the precious fluid is active, fresh water moving through lakes, rivers, the atmosphere, and living creatures. So a huge amount is salt water. We know that. Um, if you're flown over the ocean, you just say, wow, this is never going to end. Um, and 1% is available in fresh water. A lot of that's tied up in glaciers and underground storage. I can tell you, if we drill a well right here where we're at VVC, we will hit water, I think, at 40, 50 feet. I think they're back 60 feet. And the deeper you go, the worse water quality you get. So yeah, there's water there, but you'd have to clean it. So um, that's why we'd like to only drill into groundwater aquifers that we can actually pull from and uh, drink. So here's a caption in your book, you'll see this. So 97.2% is all in oceans. Of that, from that 2.05, we have in ice caps and glaciers. So uh, uh, if you guys ever seen those people go down and drill in the glaciers and try to analyze how much CO2 and see how things have changed over the couple, couple hundred years, they do that because there's a large amount of uh, freshwater glaciers. Uh, groundwater makes up 0.67%. And then that active water that we see, storms, um, flooding, that's that 0.016%. Uh, photosynthesis requires water, often in enormous amounts. Plants combine water with carbon dioxide to manufacture food for themselves and herbivores that feed on them. This, pro this process, they replenish the atmosphere with, with um, oxygen gas. I can tell you plants do this like an algae in water. If you guys go to Silverwood, um, they do this during the day. They do the opposite at night. They're taking CO, or, uh, oxygen and um, they release CO2. So, um, so what's the big deal? Uh, water exists in all three states on the Earth. It covers three-fourths of our Earth's surface, essential for cell structure and function. And its unique physical and chemical properties impact our every aspect or every aspect of our environment. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but 60, 70 percent of your body is made of water. Um, it may seem like you take slice off someone's arm and it's just muscle and it's veins and stuff. Uh, all that stuff has water ingrained into it. Um, it provides form and support to cells and organs. Uh, it's a medium for all of cells' chemical reactions. So uh, most, of this, the, most of the reactions that happen, happen in water, um, or a water-based substance, what we call aqueous substance, uh, or aqueous solution. Uh, a, and a critical per, uh, participant in, in life-giving reactions, including the, the big one, photosynthesis, and respiration. So here's where we're going to get into the basically kind of the chemistry of water, which I might narrow down a little bit. But if we take solid ice, um, thermodynamics say that it's not going to take much energy or will take energy from the sun if we were to take a block of ice and just put it on the table it will want to resume back into its liquid form um, that takes a certain amount of energy um, it doesn't seem like it but it will take heat from out of the room to melt that um, melt that ice turn it into water and if we were to melt it into a, a bucket just let it sit out on a hot sunny day um, it would we turn we could capture that melted ice into a bucket and put it, then it would be a liquid. We could heat that liquid having, or actually, you know, putting in work to heat that liquid and actually causing it to change into steam. So there's three, three phases of, of, of water, solid liquid ice, or solid liquid gas, and it takes energy from a gas to come, to become a liquid, become a solid, and those are all driven by the sun. Like I said, if, it, if you think it's easy for the water to freeze, the sun had to create the storm to blow in the cold weather to make like the Great Lakes frozen over. The sun is the ultimate driver of all these natural systems that are going on. So, and if you get into it, you can calculate how many kilojoules or joules uh, it takes to calculate or to make those transformations. So when we dive into the water molecule, uh, it's actually a, a really interesting molecule because uh, 
basically you have H2O. So if you guys don't know what H2O is, it's H2, which is two hydrogens, and then one oxygen molecule. Um, the electromagnetic dipole moments, um, basically based off its electromagnet electromagnetivity, I, can't, why, I don't know why I can't say that, uh, move from the hydrogen to the oxygen, um, meaning that the electrons are going to want to favor the oxygen more than they will the hydrogens. And if you can see in this example, the electrons, since it is a polar covalent bond, so polar meaning that there is a dipole moment, which is the negative on the oxygen, and is it a co covalent bond, which means they are sharing the electrons. It's not an ionic bond, it's a covalent bond. These electrons that are forming the bond are more, more closely more, are closer to the oxygen, meaning that these can create pseudo bonds with other oxygen ions, other oxygen um, atoms that are in water. So they stick together tenaciously. Um, high surface tension of any liquid. If you guys have ever gone fly fishing or gone to the lake and seen like a pristine lake and then seen a, a fly or an insect land on the lake, you're like why does it sink? That's the bug using the surface tension of the water to actually stay up. Um, uh, capillary action is the key to groundwater movement, um, tra transpiration of water through plants. So water can also move up. So if you were to start watering uh, a plant underneath it, the capillary fringe would actually cause the water to move up just a tiny bit. So in your book, this is something that I read that I thought that I didn't learn until my third or fourth year in, in chemistry, but I highlighted it because I thought you guys would. Uh, water dissolves so many things that truly, truly pure water is rare if ever found in nature. So um, think about that next time you get into, <laughs> you get bottled water and it's nice pristine spring water. Water, oh, where'd my PowerPoint go? There we go, okay. So, oh, okay. So when you see, let's, sodium chloride is a very common element found in most waters just because in most soils you can find salt, table salt. But when you break that down and you dissolve it into water, it, it forms sodium and chloride ions. And what happens is the dipole moments that we talked about, the, the, the delta positive and negative, um, the dipole moments will form basically pseudo bonds around this chlorine atom and basically hunk around it almost like this to where it almost becomes a little viscous. If you've ever seen water that has a lot of ions or a lot of total dissolved solids, you splash it up, it's not, it's more viscous, meaning it's kind of, uh, viscosity is the uh, measurement of how thick something is or how, um, uh, you think about oil, right? The motor oil is very heavy, very viscous. You think about nice pure water, you can Splash up. There's a big difference if you were to take um, water that was splashed by, or water that is dissolved a lot of sodium chloride, like seawater, versus pure H2O, which you can make in a lab, but it's rarely found in nature because water has this tendency to surround these chloride or sodium ions or other ion, um, other atoms that are um, found in nature, such as arsenic or chromium. But these dipole moments, you can see the negatives go to the positives. And they, they form pseudo bonds and they crowd around it. So imagine this just with another layer, another layer, another layer, another layer. That's why um, that's what forms viscosity and also um, what allows like sodium chloride to actually dissolve. Because you guys have dumped salt into water and had it not dissolved. Um, but o over time, nature does that. We heat it up, we speed up nature, and we heat it up with our stove to dissolve it. So. Um, the heating capacity of water, um, he, water has a, an incredible ability to uh, wet heat off of most items. Um, we see this through sweating, through swamp coolers. Um, it moderates the Earth's climate, which we see with storms and clouds, um, and it moderates cell temperature. So, um, Water bonding, um, ice is less dense than water, thus when it forms, it will flow to the top. If you see, um, you kind of take this out, you can kind of see the H2O right here, and you form it, you see it's forming these bonds. Um, when it freezes, it forms this perfect lattice, and you guys can, um, you see this at lakes where, where um, you know, lake freezes over, you would think that the lake would freeze from the bottom up, 
but actually when water freezes, it becomes less dense than water. That's why it floats. So if you take ice cubes and you put it in your water, it will float because it's less dense because it forms this nice structure like this when it freezes and it's caked on top of each other instead of liquid where all these would just be running into each other kind of like a gas. So that's why, it, that's why lakes freeze over on the top and protect the ecosystem underneath. So it's all about a density thing. Uh, um, Freshwater sustaining life and generates food, energy, and products. Distribution and pollution are the problem. I don't know if we're going to get into distribution today. Um, but like I said, this, the first chapter kind of touched on a bunch of different things. So um, now we're going to get, I think, to more, more weather items. Um, I did want to, this was something that I thought was very interesting, uh, the quote. Um, I'll read it to you guys because I, I actually, this ha I did this um, with this last drought and us coming out of this last drought, um, thinking about the water rich years like we had last year and then this dry year we're headed into. So, and it never failed that during the dry years, the people forgot about the rich years. And during the wet years, they lost all memories of the dry years. That makes sense. If you look at stats and water meters and all this data that the science community or water districts are starting to, starting to prove that since we had a wet year last year, people are now using more water. They still haven't started to conserve like we are headed into a drought right now. Water districts see that with water meters, and uh, we all have really nice uh, water meters now that can tell the difference. So um, the normal climate of California includes droughts. Um, very rarely does California weather actually match long-term averages. If you look at our weather pattern, and this has been very generalized, and we, we established this at kind of looking at stream gauges and weather patterns for our watershed. Typically, we get two to one to three storms every 10 years. So the river will flow one to three, one to three times every 10 years. So those are the real big events. If you guys ever see, whenever that happens, I encourage you to come over to Bear Valley and just look at the river and see how much water is actually flowing. So our watershed goes you know, 80, mile, 80 plus miles out to Newberry Springs, and it supplies water out to those communities out there. So, um, how much time do I have? They're they're out of here, Neville. The students are. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay. Okay. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. Okay. So. And if you guys don't, if you guys have questions, shout them out. Um, so we talk a lot about El Nino and La Nina conditions. So what? All right, just. One of those like things I like, see myself like. Music went away. Yeah, I just. Like, if we could. Rock and roll. Yeah. We're. That's interesting. There we go. Okay. So when we talk about El Nino and La Nina, we're talking about temperatures of the oceans and the the predictability of how warm the oceans are, and or how how. Uh, how cold that year will be. So when we're looking at El Nino, it refers to a long scale or large scale ocean atmospheric climate interaction linked to a periodic warming in the sea, sea surface temperatures across the Central and East Asia equatorial Pacific zone. So if you think about the, the equator, it's not up here by California. It's down here. Um, the purple is actually colder water. The white is warmer water. And you can see it come up the coast of Mexico, even into kind of Southern California. What that does is it produces really warm water, and that's where we typically see a lot of, um, last year we saw a lot of atmospheric floods, atmospheric rivers actually flow into California from the west, just dump a lot of rain and snow. Um, and this year in Nevada, as it was snow, up north, I don't think it was as cold because when you have these El Nino events, they typically, if you're not above a certain elevation, it usually falls as rain. So if you guys have heard about the, um, uh, the dam up north that broke. I can't think of it right off the top of my head. What's that dam? That, that da Oroville, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the Oroville Dam. I mean, the reason that dam was having so many issues is because there's so many, so many atmospheric rivers just going east and just dumping a ton of rain. Um, if they were a little bit south and were to hit the Sierra Nevadas, like towards Mammoth or Lake, da Lake Tahoe, they would have just dumped, you know, if you heard Salt Tahoe, they were getting 6 to 10, 12 feet per, st per storm. So um, that's what this El Nino condition uh, 
really, really presents. It presents the opportunity. It doesn't mean we're always going to get rain. I think a couple years ago, everyone said, oh, there's a Godzilla El Nino coming, and it was the driest year on record. So just because it, we set the stage as there's, it's an El Nino year, it doesn't mean we're actually going to get the weather. So the presence of an El Nino can significantly influence weather patterns, ocean conditions, and marine fisheries. If you guys are deep sea fishermen, warmer water will drive game, big game fish like tuna, marlin, all that stuff. Actually, yeah, marlin up from, I was thinking marlin or swordfish, up from the tip of Baja, typically where you go to catch these big game fish, and they would push them north. So you can catch these warm water fish right off the coast of California. So that's also a big thing um, if you're in the fishing like I am. So um, the fisheries across large portions of the globe for an extended period of time. So, and then I had was going to watch this video. I don't know if we can... Just, yeah, just click on that. Uh, actually, just, yeah, go back and then hit. Or, yeah, that big one right there. I don't know if there's volume on here. Right here. You guys hear it? Yeah. No? No, it'd be on the it'd be on the computer. I try, I try to include as much pictures and visual aids, but sometimes it's just it's okay. They can. Uh, yeah, you guess. Watch, they'll watch that at home. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I can kind of explain what they're talking about. But, so you can go ahead and play it. But see how the, this is low pressure? If you have a bunch of warm water that's around the, the, the equator and moving up, this low pressure will generate storms that will take storms and drive them in. Um, you can see them moving faster in the northern part of the hemisphere. In the south, you can see they're moving very slow. So still, um, even with the, the good El Nino, um, uh, that we had last year, the southern part of California still did not get a lot of rain. It was mainly northern California. You can just exit out of there. Yeah. So it's in the PowerPoint. So just it's on YouTube. You just yeah, just close that. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So now let's look at La Nina conditions, which we're in right now. Um, La Nina, simply put, is a cold event. Um, basically, we're not going to have many. You can see the warm water over on the, oh, what would that be? More in the East Pacific compared to relative to where we're at. And you see this, these, these colder waters where um, uh, represents periods of below average sea surface temperatures across the, the equatorial Pacific. Um, Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in the tropics. Oh, oh, yeah. It's sitting over the West Indies right now, so it's away from us. Yeah. It, it's, it's ocean surface temperature variations. So that's what's the difference between La Nina and El Nino. So, um, but typically, I said this is weather, so we can't say definitively, but typically a La Nina year winter temperatures will be warmer than normal, which we've experienced this year, right? It's been pretty warm this, this entire winter. Um, than the normal in the southwest and cooler than normal in the northwest. So we've seen it be kind of cold in the northwest um, in the United States. So um, kind of following exactly what the El Nino depicts. So um, weather continued. Sierra Nevada can be 20 times great as 20 times as great in a wet year as in dry years. Um, you know, let's look at NOAA. If you guys have any questions about climate change or anything like that, go to N O. AA, it's National Oceanography and um, as Atmospheric, uh, uh, they're the standard governmental agency that does all the science. So, but you can see in 2010, we had 2010 to 2011, December 2010, we had a really big flood here in the, in the high desert. Um, 
but the next year was really dry. You can see it in the Sierra Nevada snowpack. Um, 2013 was an okay year. We had 2014 extremely dry. You can see the difference between what's not only in California, but also look in Nevada because that feeds the Colorado River shed like we were talking about. And um, the, nor the North Central Valley, you can see it's fed by all these mountains, by Lake Shasta, all those, all those big lakes up there. 2015, same, almost same. I mean, maybe a little bit better. Um, 2016, we had a really good year. And then 17, um, uh, we had also a really good year. It was last year that 17, yeah, it was a really good year. This is, you can see the purple, it gets into even deeper purples here on the Sierra Nevadas, where, you know, a lot of that water runs off into the Central Valley and the San Joaquin Valley, Central Valley. A lot of it flows off into the Owens Valley, which is then piped down into LA. So a lot of the water um, goes into LA. And to kind of give you guys an idea of how that's how this is changing, what we've seen in studies is, you know, at, at Mojave, we look at, try to look at the big picture. And what we're seeing is that the we get lower lows. So we have an average, like just say low, and here's high, and then here's normal. What we're seeing is the lows are getting lower, and the highs are getting higher. So when it's dry, it's really, really dry. It's not just, you know, hey, it's kind of dry. No, it's bone dry. Kind of like this year. It's been ex exceptionally dry. And then when it snows, it snows hard. And it, 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 it not only does it flood, it may, you know, we had the dam issues up there, but that was just because of those unprecedented levels when you're dropping two inches in an hour um, with those atmospheric floods. So you can see the snowpack up here as well. So, but also you have to think snow is actually more valuable than water because snow is supposed to melt off and snowpack is supposed to be at, at its highest point. That's when they do all the measurements, April 1st. That's what they take all their, their measurements on. So April 1st is when they establish their, their snowpack measurement. Um, what we're finding is actually with climate change, it's snowing between that, that November, November, March area, but it's also starting to heat up in March to where some of the snow is already melting in March, April, and you're like, okay, well, maybe we need to adjust these snow, these, these snow surveys, or um, the water's rushing off too fast. This happened last year. Um, LA Department of Water and Power called Mojave Water Agency, and the snowpack in the Sierras was melting so fast, and they wanted to see if, if LA Department of Water and Power, if you guys ever go up to Mammoth, um, or on the 395 going up, you can see the mountains are right there, aqueduct closed down to LA, they called us and see it saw and wanted to see if we wanted to buy water from them because they just couldn't get rid of the water. It was melting too fast. So that's one big thing. I mean, if we think of climate change, this is the world getting warmer. Well, it also affects these little things as how fast does the snow melt? The snow melt really quickly. And last year we noticed that they were worried about damaging. It's kind of funny. They were worried about filling up Owens Lake. And I thought about putting Owens Lake in here, but I just, I didn't feel it was necessary, but Owens Lake is they, they drain the lake to send that water to LA and now they redirect water from it. But they're worried about the lake filling because they've spent millions and millions of dollars on environmental um, concerns about dust and um, that flying all around Southern California and help uh, hurting people's lungs. So they keep it wet, but they've made these berms so that they can keep um, water contained. They are worried about the water coming in, breaking these berms down and having to spend millions of dollars. Where that's where the water should be anyways, if you ask me. So when we think about climate change, it's not just, oh, the world's getting hotter. It's also, well, the snow may, may and I can tell you, is melting faster. So getting back on the track, um, strong El Nino years often lead to wetter than normal winters for Northern California with smaller effect in Southern part of the state. Kind of saw that last year. Um, Actually, we did see that last year. Cycling between El Nino and La Nina every three to seven years is a national phenomenon that can be traced back thousands of years. That's kind of what we're going into. I wouldn't be surprised if we, we re-enter this drought. We never were really out of the drought, but that one year um, provided us enough water so we can take it from the state water project. But we'll get to that here soon. Um, when we talk about a drought, um, no simple criteria can define droughts. So we can't say, well, since we didn't get any rain here in Mojave, we're in a drought condition. Um, you know, it could rain like it, like it did last year, tremendously up north to where we can move a lot of water through the state water project and we can buffer that droughtness. 
but there's no one simple criteria that define a trout. You have to look at the groundwater levels, you have to look at reservoir levels, you have to have all this plethora of data and then someone that actually knows how to understand it. And that's kind of what you guys are here for, to learn how to understand it. So drought emergency, when there's too little supply to meet demand. Um, if you guys saw last year, you guys said, hey, you reduce it by 32%. You guys probably saw all those signs or the water conservation things. That's basically the drought emergency. I wouldn't be surprised if you, see, if you heard those this year. Uh, different regions may perceive a given year's rainfall totally different depending on the local storage capacities, alternative supplies, regional populations. So some people like in, uh, in the Bishop or Mammoth area uh, may find that that snow is normal. The, the low snowfall is normal and they have groundwater aquifers that are fine. For us with our growing population, um, we would always like a nice snowpack in the San Bernardino Mountains, but um, with climate and climate change, that's looking less and less likely. Um, the most severe droughts uh, that they have on history uh, was between 1929 and 1934. They got those from tree rings. So if you guys read the first chapter, you guys will see that they chiseled out tree rings and do basically the growth of a tree is based on the tree ring. And they were able to see how much it grew between those, those dates. And they were able to say that, wow, there's a really bad drought because a tree is not going to grow if it doesn't have enough water. So, and from 2012 to 2016, I'm going to say in the future they're going to classify 2012 to 2017, 18 as all one drought. So, so what do I get every day and what do I have to look at every day? So this is something I pulled off my email and I was like, well, let's show them what they look at. So what's happening right now in the hey, snowpack? Yeah. Can you, can you in a little bit? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. sorry. There you go. Thanks. Um, so what's happening now with the snowpack? So this is what's 220. This was yesterday. Uh, chance of shower on 220, otherwise cold and sunny. That's northern, northern California forecast. The same goes for Truckee area, except for the chance of shit snow shower on 220. Precipitation as of today. So northern Sierra precipitation index, 19.7 um, inch, 59% of average for the state. So that's pretty low. Um, southern Sierra Nevada, uh, 9.4 inches, which is 37% of average for this day. Not very much. So that's just precipitation. So that's rain. Uh, excuse me. Precipitation is rain and snow. The average snow water equivalents as of this date. So we have we, when we look at the Sierras, we look at the north, the central, the south, and then we look at overall. So the south, we're at four inches, which is 17% of normal for the state, which is bad. Central, which is 5.6 inches, which is 24% of normal for the state. South, uh, which is 3.8, is 18%. So statewide, we're averaging about 4.5 inches of snow in the, in the Sierra Nevadas, which is 20% normal for this day. It's really bad. So um, unless we get, you know, March showers or, you know, a lot of rain from these showers right now, um, it looks like we're going to be headed back into that dry spell. Um, the single driest calendar, the single driest year, calendar year recorded came in 2014. If you guys saw, go back to that. That snowpack level, you'll see how much snow was not there. Snowpack was only 5% of the average, the lowest ever measured. Um, I think you guys remember Governor Jerry Brown standing there recording the snow level and there being no snow there. So when there's usually five or six feet. Um, in the 21st century, climate change appears to be contributing. Um, 2014 was also the warmest year in California. So take those two hand in hand, driest and the warmest. Um, it says Mitch, since it is the mismatch between demand and supply that define growth, drought, population growth that defines drought. So if there was no one here and it was dry, no one, no one, no one would care. But since there's people here, we have to declare it's a drought, right? Um, out in the middle of, um, oh, I won't go there. But um, population growth is another element. So wherever the population is growing, which it is, it will grow up here. Um, the, the water is also going to be one of the main contributors to um, population growth um, in this region. So um, during the extreme drought 2014, California had 16 million, 16, more, 16 million more people than during the 1966-1977 drought. So back then, they didn't have water efficient toilets, faucets, they weren't water conscious. They may not have been water as conscious as they were as, as they are now, but um, you can't deny that 16, more, 16 million more people wouldn't cause the, cause, uh, the use of more water. 
With such variability between seasons and between years, water storage systems, particularly reservoirs created by dams, um, help moderate these uh, events. So like if we're going into a dry year, last year was really wet, which they filled up a reservoir in central California, and that name is eluding me right now too. Um, but we can pull water from there. We have water stored there for times like these. So San Luis right? Reservoir, thank you. Um, so we, we have, along with a lot of other state water contractors, um, have water stored there so we can use it for these times like, um, like this. Um, which moderate the swing. So, you know, you have wet cycles and dry cycles. Basically what we want to do is take those, those peaks and troughs and try to smooth it out just a little bit. Um, the Sierra, Sierra Nevada snowpack is the largest and most effective reservoir. Um, in 1929, this, the state legislature established the statewide um, snow surveys program coordinated by the Department of Water Resources. So they recognized this back in the 30s. They say we need to start measuring how much snow is here. So, um, and that kind of goes to show you even 70, we're, we're almost 20 years in, so almost 90 years ago, they knew this is going to be an issue in the future. So, and here you guys are learning about it today. Um, so each year, 300 sites are, are sampled for uh, sampled for depth, snow depth. Um, the snowpack data, along with precipitation records, rain gauges, um, help DWR planners fact, forecast water supply that is going to be available to water contractors such as Mojave. So up and down the state, there's state water contractors. So um, they bought into the state water project when it was being when it was in the inception in the early 50s, 60s. So we have access to the aqueduct or the state water project that kind of go, that goes through Hesperia and ends up in Silverwood Lake. So um, how, do we, how are we able to fund that? Um, as a homeowner in this area, I pay property taxes to Mojave Water Agency and so does every house um, to fund the availability for water to be here. So I know there's, you were on the field trip where we had the aqueduct, right? Yeah, I think you were too. I don't know if anybody else was, but uh, I know that uh, you know, that's a big deal for us. We do a lot of stuff with the aqueduct, but I know we're gonna get into that in just a couple chapters. Uh, tree rings, we talked about that. Uh, trees don't grow. When there's, when there's abundance of water, a tree's gonna grow. Use that water to grow. Um, when there's not a lot, it's not gonna grow that much, if any. Um, floods, how much time do I have? About 10 minutes, floods. Um, at, another, at the other extreme, floods are equally normal equally normal products of California climate in Central Valley used to be flooded annually. Um, Central Valley used to operate on a, and they're still, they're playing with this now at, at, at big universities, uh, flood irrigation. I know the Imperial, Imperial IID, Imperial Irrigation District, um, down in Imperial County by San Diego, or inland from San Diego, um, used to flood irrigate their fields. And that's not the most proper way to do it. They just had the, I think you just went to the World Ag Expo, right, Neville? I did. Yes. So they are shying away from this flood ag where basically you have this trench and you just flood the farm, flood the fields with water um, where now they're having drip line and specific watering down to the root zone. And even now talking about installing under underground root or watering systems. Yeah, subsurface. Subsurface. So no water is even going to touch the surface because then you get evaporation, you lose water, you lose water in the soil. So even though it goes in the ground, not all of it reaches the root zone. So that water that's stuck in the soil will actually evaporate. So the Central, some Central Valley, they used to do flood irrigation, not anymore. Not with all these new laws and the drought, it's going to the way of you're gonna have to specifically put a drip emitter on each tree, which costs you know money to the grower and all these other um, types of uh, uh, technology. I think now we have, I think we, we, we give them out. I don't know if you have one, Neville, but on my, on my irrigation system, it'll sense if, uh, it, based on the temperature, humidity, um, and a couple other things, it'll determine how much it, the grass or the plants need to get watered. Based it's called on, a smart, smart controller. Yeah, smart controllers. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but they take in all that data and they make an informed decision based off a chart and they say this needs to be watered for six minutes today instead of four or 10 minutes because it was extra dry. So, so we're getting smarter. That flood irrigation is going away. They have brought up at some, I know uh, 
one of the Ivy League schools was talking about flooding almond orchards and seeing if that was a good way to, to do groundwater recharge. So groundwater charge, put a bunch of water onto the ground. Hopefully it's, it, it recharges the groundwater aquifer below the ground, but um, they're still in testing for that. Um, this was a big one. Floods, riparian forests were cut down so crops could be planted right up to the, the edges of the river. Um, riparian habitat is really important. Um, I know that in Mojave Water Agency we have riparian zones and wells that monitor the riparian zone. A riparian zone is basically anything abutting a river. So if, let's say VVC wasn't here, but there was, uh, there was a forest that went all the way up to the river, that forest would be a riparian forest because it would get water from the river. And what would happen is they were chopping down these forests so they could plant crops. And you see this in South America um, all the time, them chopping down forests. Um, if you were in our last class, I showed a contrast between 10 years before and after, and you can see a huge section of forest cut out because of um, the, the South American people won't need to gain money and support their family, so they chop down the forest and, and grow crops right by the river. So um, Towns were also planted. So wherever there's water, there's kind of a town. I mean, that's kind of the way, the way it goes. Um, LA was kind of founded by bringing water in from Northern California. Um, Sacramento and River City, um, you know, they were they were established by rivers because there was water there. Um, um, so we covered that. So forty percent of the annual snowpack arrives suddenly in just a few atmospheric river events. Talked about that. Water planners and engineers established the hundred-year flood concept. Um, so a hundred-year flood concept is how much water would it take to, would a hundred years, and in, 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 it's kind of difficult to explain, but a hundred year storm would be basically, in a hundred year storm event, uh, I always get trouble, help me out here Noah. The probability of uh, a hundred year storm event happening every single year is, I'm, I'm way off on this. Uh, where, where am I going with this? hundred year storm. Yes, yeah, not, not, it's not every 100 years. It's the probability of having a 100-year storm. So if you're thinking about, oh, I can't, you know, this huge storm that's going to have every 100 years, um, the probability of that having, happening every year, um, there's not really a number associated with it. It's different to every area, but you can have a two- or 300-year storm event, which means that um, you take that and you multiply it by two, but you can have back-to-back 200-year -back storm events. So basically it's the probability of having a... Um, storm every hundred years. And the pro because yeah. it's the probability down to one year, yes. that probability is way over one in a hundred, is I think what you're getting. Yes. Because for, if you want to look at one specific year, do I need to get my planning done by next year? Well, the probability of that hundred year fall on that one year becomes millions, millions to one. Yes. Because yeah. of the one year. And yeah. And, and I didn't know that because my mom was a math teacher. So. Oh, but yeah, it's kind of yeah, yeah, it's kind of hard to explain the hundred year storm event. But when you hear about it and you think of it, it it comes to, comes to mind. So they established this hundred years this hundred year flood concept, and it's basically whatever, what, the hundred year storm event. So yeah, I'm not going to get back into that. Uh, Google it. I'm sure they have a better explanation. I'm sorry, I don't. Um, California experienced major floods in 1850. 1995, 1964, 1995, 1997, 2017. Um, January 2017 was the largest in state history. 1997 was the largest in state history. 120,000 people were forced from their homes and a 300 square mile of agricultural lands were flooded, followed, followed by a record setting dry period from February to June 1997. Floods have and will play an important role in the in, in part in California water. I can tell you when it floods here in the Mojave River, we rejoice because we see all the water percolate into the sand on the riverbed out here. And what that does is it's like dropping an ice cube into a pool. If you had a straw over here that was barely almost touching the water, if you drop a big ice, a big, big piece of ice over here, it's gonna force the water level up over here. And so now that person can drink or I can drink. It's so basically the water's percolating in there, pushing water levels up everywhere else. So when we see water flowing, it's a good thing. You, we can see water levels pop up everywhere. Because that's what, 
And so what we do, we monitor the groundwater levels. And when it rains, you can see not only just by the river, but over by Victorville, you can see them slightly pop up. So it's actually really interesting. And that's all I had. You guys have some questions? Yeah, go ahead. Stop. I'll keep recording in case they go. Oh, okay. Any questions? You go ahead. So, um, so the, the reason why you bring up the uh, the Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Can you repeat the question then, just in case? Uh, you go ahead. Well, go ahead and ask it again. <laughs> so the uh, the flood event, the hundred year flood event you mentioned, is just like a mental tool to pregame the worst case scenario for what when we're designing water management systems. And the answer to that is yes. Um, I, just to carry on uh, for the Mojave, do we? traditionally have to worry about these th those things. You mentioned that it's something that we can rejoice over because our because our natural environment kind of can take that, that big of a hit when it comes around. Yeah. Well, the, let me dive into this because this is actually a really cool topic that I like to talk about. Yeah. Most, most people think that, let me get, get this on record, most people think that when it rains, um, typically water is going to fall up in the upper watershed, right? So when it comes over, uh, we're gonna have a, a, a not a big storm. It comes over the uh, the mountains and it's it rains tremendously up there. We, I can think of the 2005 and 2011 storm events. They were massive up here. The river flowed. 19 inches fell up in Crestline. Um, I think eight to 12 fell in Victorville. So, yes, flooding is an issue. It it it, it is something to rejoice and to be cognizant of. But um, when we have these 2011 floods, you're going to see the river, and we're going to get into this with watersheds, but they all have tributaries. So since we've built development on both sides of the river and along the river the entire way, in, most, in some cases, there's all tributaries running to the river. So um, the lifeblood of this valley and of the Mojave region is the river. So yes, it is dangerous to, to, to watch out for your family and everything like that. Totally agreed. But at the same time, that's where we get a majority of our water. We're a state water contractor, but I can tell you that there's no replacement for those huge storms. I mean, so when it rains up there, we have, everyone thinks that the Silver Wood Dam is going to break. Not, not going to say it can happen, but it, the probability is extremely low, right? Um, so what happens is waterfalls and you have basically two thirds of the flow come from the Deep Creek side of things, uh, which is from Crestline and Lake Arrowhead. And then you have the West Fork, which is kind of by, uh, if you're going to Silverwood, you pass the 173. That's kind of that wash heading this way. We call that the West Fork. They meet up at that Mojave River Dam. If you just go up the riverbed, you'll hit a dam. That's the Mojave River Dam. If you guys go off-roading, you can drive your, not supposed to, but I've seen people drive their Jeep through there. But that is a flood control structure that has an outlet that has a predetermined um, amount of flow that can flow through it. So what happens is water will build up behind that dam and it'll create a head and it will shoot out water um, at a predetermined amount, which is 23,500 CFS. A 31 acre feet per minute, I think I calculated it at. So even with that, in the 2005 storms, I believe some houses failed on this side of Spring Valley Lake because of the river and the proximity to Spring Valley Lake. So yeah, there is that, that always that worry, but um, you know, I know there was there was a chart that me and uh, one of the engineers were looking at at work that, based on our topography and everything, that the maximum amount that could fall in a in a given day was 12 inches of rain. Um, based on the topography, so now whether that's true or not, nature will always overcome engineering and mathematics and all that. Um, so could it happen? Yeah, but we do count on those storms because those storms not only reach here, they reach out to Barstow, which replenishes their groundwater aquifer. There's a lot of people, and a lot of people don't know this, but once you get a step out of side of the Victor Valley area, you know, the cities, you go to Barstow or you go to Newberry on your way to Vegas or on the 40 on your way to the river, you know, a lot of those people out there, there's not a water system. They're on a well. 
essentially what's getting pumped for you, getting chlorinated and sent to you um, if you live in a city or, or on a system. So a lot of those people are on wells, and I can tell you that right now we have a project at work that deals taking, taking grant money and drilling wells for people. So let's take it a perfect example. There was a, a person up on the Apple Valley Heights. So if you go kind of up the river, you kind of turn left after you hit deep, or you basically run Deep Creek all the way up, and you see houses up on the heights of, of this big hill. Someone had moved in there in 2005, and um, they had drilled a well. When the well driller was drilling, they drilled the well when the water table was high. So they drilled it to where they thought it would be okay during drought cycle. Well, right there is a very dynamic area, so it, the highs can go really high, and it can actually go really low. Well, her well went dry, so now we take grant money, and we're, we drilled her a new well down, I think, to 600 feet. So a lot of people don't know, but... A lot of people are on wells here. So when we when I talk about the importance of floods, you are correct. Uh, safe, public safety and human life outweigh um, natural resources, hands down. But those floods are extremely important to us. So if you look at a lot of the major drainages, um, even set up by the city, they're all directed towards the river. So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I, like I said, we get very excited because when that happens, you get to see the science happen. When, all the, when the river's flowing, these you see wells that are 60, 70 feet to water, they pull up to like 20 or 30. You're like 30 feet of water filled up that void. And you're like, wow, that's insane. And if you look at a lot of our hydrographs, um, I didn't put it in here, because I kind of wanted to stay along with what the book had, but you can see that we funnel in this, you know, drought, rain, drought, rain, drought, rain. And a lot of our water, majority of our water comes from rain events. We, as a state water project, water, uh, state water contractor can take water from the aqueduct and put it on the ground and mimic nature as a flood, but there is no substitution for the mass amounts of water you get.